All right, it's um, 8 p.m. GMT. Um, for once in a lifetime, I start this webinar uh, during the day, uh, daytime. So uh, while well, visiting UC Berkeley, so that's really cool. And uh, my request from Penty, so I also have this redwood trees on the background. So, uh, but uh, with, uh, without any further delay, so let me introduce our today's speaker. Uh, Tao Yu from Cornell University. And uh, so, well, I uh, leave the introduction of your talk to, to you. So uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you for the introduction. Let me share the screen. Can everyone see it now? Yes, yes, we okay. can see it. Yeah, okay. Uh, so. Yeah, it's, I'm very happy to be uh, to present and here. Yeah, on our project on um, understanding hyperdimensional computing for parallel single path learning. And see, uh, in this project, we mainly want to look at what's the limit of hyperdimensional computing, and from a theoretical perspective, and try to propose some new models and solve the problem. And this is joint work with uh, some professors and. Uh, uh, collaborators in, in, in canal. Okay, I would like to uh, start a talk by uh, recall some backgrounds, a very simple background on hyperdimensional computing. So we're computing with uh, something called hypervectors, which are vectors in a very high dimensional space. For example, the uh, binary uh, binary, uh, binary cell with, with D dimension 10 thousand, which is a point in the hyperdimensional space. We can also view it as a corner of the hypercube. And there are some reasons, many reasons for us to be interested in this kind of setup. For example, many operations of hyperdimensional computing can be highly parallel, and uh, hypervectors are robust to noises. The reason for that, just a quick review, is that uh, some mm, nice geometrical, geometrical properties of this uh, framework is that for example, given a corner, you a corner in the hypercube. How far is it to other corners? And by some simple geometry, we know that the number of corners at a having distance k okay, to the this given corner is a binomial coefficient. Um, you just sample k different from the from the d dimensional total d dimensions. And specifically, we can plot this distribution here that. Uh, by given a dis uh, given corner, we can plot the distance of a corner to other corners, uh, to other all the corners in the in the hypercubes, and plot the distribution by normalizing this distance correspondingly. And uh, with that to see, we can see that this distribution is kind of a, a very close to a binomial distribution in the sense that the probability of this relative um, uh, this distance is smaller than point. 0.47 is less than a thousand minutes. And on the other side, the distance which is greater than 0 0.53 is less, the probability of this uh, distribution is less than a thousand minutes. So most of the space uh, uh, in, in, in this hypercube are for, uh, consists of points in the middle, which is a 600 bit wide area containing uh, most of the space, right? And uh, so in, in with this nice uh, some geometrical properties, we can we can know that two random vectors, which we sample randomly from this space, so two random vectors will uh, be very likely they will differ in around five thousand bits, and uh, so we call this this kind of vectors unrelated and in some sense orthogonal. We'll show later that and uh, uh, when we we talk about the robustness of hyperdimension vector in last slide that. In a sense that if we now flip the uh, original vector by um, one third of the base in the total top 10 thousand dimensions, it can still be recognized as the original air free vector because it's, it's about zero, um, one, th one third uh, distance to having this um, relative having distance to the original given point. But if you sample random from space, that um, distance, relative having distance will be around 0 0.5. 
more formally, we do, we I want to uh, define kind of the half-dimensional representation or computations in this space. But here we have some hypervectors which are in a high-dimensional space. We call this uh, space some hyperspace, and some examples of this hyperspace including zero one the binary the binary spatter uh, spatter code, and also uh, we can also use uh, um, bipolar representation MAP B, and also we can use integers uh, space and the real uh, or even continuous space real numbers and uh, complex numbers even for example. And uh, due to the cost of dimensionality, when we're, we were given a random vector V, we know that most of vectors in this hyperspace will be orthogonal to this given hypervector. And this immediately gives some two different um, uh, observations. So first, if we independently random sample randomly from this hyperspace, these two sample have access hypervectors are likely to be unrelated. And therefore we can use these kind of hypervectors to represent semantically separate objects. And the second observation is that on the other side that if we have two hypervectors, U and V, that have a very high inner product similarity, for example, then we can know that that these two uh, hypervectors are related with hyper probability due to the nice geometry properties we introduced in last slide. And to in, in general, I think everyone is familiar that the in general hyperdimensional computing uh, framework, we represent we can use this hypervector to represent data using represent data and compute use a fixed set of arithmetic, including similarity, binding, bundling, and the permutation uh, uh, operations. Uh, for example, uh, the a typical similarity function will measure how close two hypervectors are. For example, the uh, uh, typical choice is of an inner product function by appropriately, appropriately scaled to by the total distance. It will measure how close or similar to hypervectors when we sample from the hyperspace, how close they are. And so clearly this similarity function will give us a value between minus one and the one, right? And uh, as for the other three arithmetics, including the first the binary operation, I will, I will do a quick review of this, or I'm pretty familiar, uh, familiar with this. The first the binding operation is a commutative operation that serves our purpose to connect a pair of hypervectors, U and V, into a new hypervector. So normally, I, I would uh, think about U and V as different features of the same object. So this binary operation will connect information of these two features into the new hypervectors. And this new hypervectors is not similar to U and V when we use the similarity function to measure it. But it will preserve the similarity in the following sense that the product uh, binary of U and W with uh, binary of V and W will be the similarity of them will be same as the similarity of U and V. And for example, just simple example in the bipolar representation of the hyperspace, uh, the binary operation is actually a coordinate wise multiplication. And it can scale, it can be very parallel because it, you can, we compute the multiplication in a coordinate wise manner. And the second operator is a binary bundling operator. Um, the, it serves as a goal to aggregate a set of hypervectors and it will output a representative hypervector which is maximally similar to its impulse because uh, so it's kind of an aggregate of the impulse vector hypervectors and uh, the, the maximal similar is defined in the following sense that it will find the hypervector in the same hyperspace that is maximal similar to all, all, all the impulse hypervectors. And also as an example in the bipolar representation hyperspace, hyperspace this bundle operation is actually the, the, the sign element-wise sign of the sum of the impulse hypervectors. And you can see that these two uh, operations are very simple and uh, it can be used in a very parallel manner. And uh, usually we also need to complement this arithmetic with one more permutation operator. Re reason for this is because the bundling operator is commutative and also 
the bundling operator of two different hyperactors is also commutative. So, uh, but sometimes we need to encode some order or position information. So we need this permutation operator uh, to, to encode this uh, position information. A permutation is just invertible shuffling of the order of elements in a type of vector. And the, result, the resulting permutated vector is not similar to its uh, original vector. We, uh, here similar means that we measure the similarity using similarity function. And uh, uh, I will try to give some two very simple uh, examples of using hyperdimensional computing. The, very, the first one is very famous, well-known currency retrieval, ret uh, retrieving uh, application. The goal is to find what's the currency of a country. For example, here we have uh, United States and China with corresponding currency uh, dollar and the CN1, right? And uh, so when we use the hyperdimensional computing in this application, we will go through firstly the encoding procedure. procedure. In, the, in the first stage, it will assign a random basis vector to each identity. For example, it will uh, assign C1 and C2 in a very high dimension vector, hyperspace, uh, for example, 10,000 dimension, and uh, two different basis hypervectors sampled randomly from the space to represent uh, uh, each country, and also two different um, basis hypervector to represent their currencies. And then with this uh, sampling uh, hypervectors, we compute a future a uh, filter representative by connect because C1 and M1 actually correspond to the features of the same object. So we connect them together and then bond them together to get a so-called filter, filter representative. And then how can we do query when we have a, a, a country coming and ask what someone asks, what's the currency of the United States? So the method is very simple that we compute uh, the we just bind the currency of the United States hypervector to the filter uh, hypervector. And due to some, some very simple, um, prop, due to some properties of this binding and bonding operators, we can derive it equals M1 bonded together with the binding of C1, C2, and uh, M2. And uh, due to the properties of bundling and binding, we know that this R will be similar to M1 and the C1 binding with C2 and M2. The second one is not a meaningful identity because uh, the, the binding of C1, C2, M2 will not be similar to M2. But we know R, this resulting R hypervector is similar to M1 due to the property of bundling operator. And we can, therefore, we can write R equals to M1 plus some noise. And it will be very similar to the M, uh, M1 hypervector. So to do query, we just need to find the currency hypervector with the highest uh, similarity to this R and the return corresponding currency, which is a uh, dollar, right? So it's a very simple usage of, uh, of uh, hyperdimensional computing for currency retrieval. In. And uh, secondly, we uh, the task we were looking to in our in, in this project is that in a slightly, slightly complicated task on MNIST. MNIST is a data set with handwritten digits, um, data set of 28 by 28 degree images. It consists of 60, uh, 60 sound training images and 10 sound test images with each image belongs to 10 uh, one of the 10 class from zero to nine, right? And uh, similarly, it will, we will use hyperdimensionally to go through the same procedure as the, exam, the first application, right? So we first encode each image into some represent into some vector representation. For example, to do that, we the message is that we draw 256 random basis vector from the bipolar representation hyperspace to represent uh, the pixel intensities. It, it means that each VI will represent a pixel intensity I of the gray image because the gray images are um, uh, uh, discrete integers from zero to 255. So we represent each intense int pixel intensity with uh, basis hypervectors uh, sampled randomly from the hyperspace. And then as what we have did in the first application, we bind all this all of these 28 by 28 pixels by corresponding hypervectors. But as we just mentioned that 
this binding operator is not commutative. So if we just uh, combine all the hub vectors together, it will we will lose the position information. So before the binding, we actually shift that corresponding hub vectors uh, by uh, using the older information before binding all, all of them together. Means that if we if we assume the input pixel intensity of a given MNIST image is P0 to P 783, then the encoded hub vector will be uh, the binding of of uh, this formula here diff, uh, a multiply here we apply a multiply times of permutation to corresponding location of the hyper vectors and then in this way we get a vector uh hyper vector representation for each image then how can we do training or learning using this hyper dimension commuting we learn it by bundling so we bundle all the hyper vectors that the, all the image, the hyper vectors that are from the same digits that we find all the hyper vectors which belong to the same class. For example, we find all the hyper vectors that are of image zero, right? And we bundle them together to generate a representative. And because the properties of bundling operation, we know that this is kind of some class vector as C, it will be close. It will similar to each image image in the training data set and uh, we hope this um, class representative can learn the distribution and generate to, to even unseen data in the training set so in this case each uh, way, the topic is powered by single pass learning each image each each training image is only used once in the whole learning process and how can we do inference now at test time when a given test image is given right we encode it through the same procedure to get his hyper vector representation t test then we just need to compile this the hyper vector to each class representative vector as c and outputs the per per class uh, similarity and find the class with the highest uh, similarity to get the uh, prediction for this image uh, which class this image belongs this test image belongs to so it, 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 we can see that in this way we can also get a very simple and straightforward method to use hyperdimensional computing for MNIST classification uh, data uh, application and now let's get into the main topic of uh, our project so uh, the rest of the talk will be divided into the uh, following uh, uh, sections first we I would want to see uh, what's the name it of uh, how about the mesh community? And um, here we uh, connect the expressivity of uh, how about the mesh to a similarity matrix. We I will detail the uh, definition later. And also we observe some limitations due to initialization of hypervectors. And then based on these limits, we try to propose different two solutions to elevate the trade-off and the approach to the limits of HDC. And then I show some experiments of our proposed model on different tasks, including some machine learning data set and uh, which are previously challenging in for hypertomic computing. Okay, so uh, now uh, a natural question is what's the uh, limits of HDC? So usually, uh, certainly we can, we know that the expressivity of HDC will be connected to the dimensionality of the hypervector SD. If we cannot, if we, sometimes we get a better result using hyperdimensional computing, we just need to increase the higher dimensionality of the methodology. But the problem comes is that while increasing the dimensionality of a hyperdimensional computing model helps and solves all the problem. And uh, it turns out no, no because um, the for, uh, and uh, we will detail why to answer the questions, we'll um, need to show some uh, examples uh in in this case and in our project we observe that uh the pair with because we are actually doing some oper operations and many similarity competitions of ba sample basis have vectors so we found that the pair with pairwise similarities of basis vectors actually matters the similarity metrics of a basic um a basic a set of basis vectors are defined as follows so for example, we were given or we sampled on different basis half vectors. We want to VN from the bipolar representation half vector. 
and the simulator matrix M, which is unbound real matrix, it, uh, it's just the similarity of pairs of hypervectors in the sense that Mij equals to the similarity of V and Vj, right? Similarity here is an inner product like uh, function. And uh, we found that this similar, similarity matrix is also actually well connected to the expressivity of upper dimension computing. And uh, in this case, a very natural question uh, we have a very beginning when we have this from the similar matrix is that, okay, so you have a HDC model. Is there any similarity matrix in the uh, HDC model that cannot achieve no matter how large D is and no matter how, what's the way of our sample name method from the hyperspace? And to answer this question, we just need to consider a very simple case when there are only three basic identities or three basic hypervectors n equals three. And we have the following lemma that the binary HDC at any dimension, no matter how large the dimension is, you sample three different basic hypervectors from the hyperspace, it cannot express, achieve this following um, similarity matrix that uh, different hypervectors will have negative half similarity. It's kind of an uh, amazing result, result, but still, it, it just cannot represent this uh, similarity matrix. Okay, then you may ask, okay, but what's the uh, result of this? What's the, uh, what's the consequence of this? What will happen if I can represent this uh, similar, similarity matrix? Okay, then we show that now this slide, I, I will show why this, uh, why it matters. The similar matrix is actually corresponding to connect to the expressivity of HDC, because we can find an example task where an HDC model it cannot learn the base uh, optimal class file depends on whether it can express this similarity matrix. So if some HDC model can express or achieve this similarity matrix, then this HDC model can learn the example task. Otherwise, it, it, it will not able to learn the, learn the task. Specifically, uh, the lemma it gave and follows, the binary HDC at any dimension cannot learn the following task. The task is a supervised learning task, very simple, with um, um, three elements, input, element, input set, with, with x equals zero contains zero, one, two. And the output label set is just same as the input, uh, input example set. So I will uh, assume the source distribution is given the follows. Um, so the probability of x equals one will be uh, one over nine, uh, one nice plus two p. And uh, here p is a very uh, some small positive number p. Uh, it's not necessary to be very small. It's just a small, a very small positive number. And uh, here we see that an HDC model can cannot or can learn this task in the sense that we see the HDC model can learn this task, this task if in this HDC model there exists a d-dimensional encoding of the input set x such that we can use the same bounding procedure as the uh, currency application example and the memory example. We can use the same bounding method on the training side of set n drawn from this source distribution, we can get a version of optimized class file with arbitrary high probability as n increases. So an HDC model can learn if this condition, you can have such a best optimal class file result, otherwise you cannot learn. And the lemma two is just very straightforward that a binary HDC at any dimension cannot learn the for, learn this task. It's very simple and the toy example task. And it shows the, the similar, similarity matrix actually corresponding to some learnability of HDC model on some ap applications. On the other side, any HDC model, for example, using a real vector space or using complex values, an HDC of this type that can express this similarity matrix can learn this task. So this again shows that a similarity matrix will correspond to the of some applications or some task. And uh, in this way, we can connect. We know that a similar, similarity matrix is connected to the expressivity of HDC, whether it can learn on some task or not, depending on whether it can learn 
express this similarity matrix. And uh, furthermore, we also observed the limitations due to initialization, because we now we know that the uh, simulator matrix of hypervectors uh, um, matters uh, for the vulnerability of HTC model on some tasks. So if, again, we just sample randomly from a hyper space, and these hypervectors will very likely to be exploitation of identity right? because due to also normal of the high dimensional space uh, property. And now we ask a question, is sampling hypervectors randomly or uniform random like a still good way for as an initialization for hypervectors or for basis vectors? So in such a system, more generally, we assume that um, any hypervector used for encoding, which is used to represent a data example, for, for example, to use uh, represent the image or to represent the filter, is con constructed in the following two different ways. First is that we just independently sampling a binary hypervector where each entry has some probability of being one from the hyperspace. The second case, we kind of we further using this pretty sample hub vectors from U1 to UK, we sample some, some of them and we use some binding and the permutation and some other operations to get some encoding of VR into VN as basis hub vectors or, or hub vectors for encoding. It's two different uh, setups uh, of uh, sampling hub vectors randomly from the hyperspace. And we show that this way, this, this way of sampling from uh, the hyperspace actually will further restrict the set of similarity metrics that can be expressed in expectation sense. Because uh, the following metrics uh, with pair with similarity of different uh, hypervectors, one minus uh, negative one third, it, can, it cannot uh, be, uh, is, when we use this kind of random initialization of hypervectors from the hyperspace, it will deviate uh, it, it will not be able to achieve it uh, in the expectation sense. But this matrix actually can be expressed by a binary HDC if we do not use this kind of a way of random uh, sampling from the hypervector space, from the hyper, hyper space. And uh, for this, then a question would be, uh, how do we find a way to express more similarity matrix for a HDC model? So we have some ways. So the first way solution is that we look at the, because the random initialization from a random uh, sampling from hyperspace will give us a bad initialization sometimes or will restrict the similarity matrix. So we propose the first solution is to encoding using the, with an, an analog to random frame features in the following sense, because um, the, we propose a more principled way to construct construct hypervectors. We claim that if we know the some have some connection, some similarities of the basic identities. So we would like to sample hypervectors to match that given similarity matrix, the target similarity matrix. And to do that, we just uh, we give the following algorithm. Uh, algorithm one, if a condition on that the the element wise a sign of uh, pi over two multiplied to m is positive semi-definite, then algorithm one will output hypervectors that in expectation exactly achieves um, the, this target similarity matrix. If, on the other side, if the element-wise sign of this matrix is not positive semi-definite, then some approximation will be produced. And in this way, we will be able to match a target similarity matrix of to make the hyper uh, basic hypervectors to have a similarity matrix same as the target similarity matrix in the expectation sense. And uh, clearly, it immediately follows that this this method can actually achieve more similarity matrices than the classical uh, uniform sampling approach from the from the hyperspace because. Uh, this one third negative one third um, matrix we call it M um, fail. This similarity matrix that we just show in lemma three that it cannot be achieved in expectation by classical HDC approach, uh, random sampling from the hyperspace approach. 
but algorithm one can achieve this simulator matrix because the size of this uh, uh, pi over two multiplied to this matrix is passing similar definite. So it will in expression exactly achieve uh, this simulator matrix. And in this way, we can match the target simulator matrix we want to match and make the hypervectors have the same, same uh, simulator matrix. However, uh, with that to see, we can just, um, it's just a way for better initialization of sampling from the hyperdimensional space. But the, there is a inherent limits for binary HDC, for example, it cannot express the M lemma one metric, which is uh, just a reminder is the negative half of different uh, hypervectors metrics that uh, of uh, different hypervectors similarities. And to uh, to express this matrix, it, it cannot be expressed in binary HDC case, but we can use non-binary hyperspace, for example, a real space or complex values to surpass limits and express this matrix, uh, which is negative half of similarities between different type of vectors. But the problem is that this space are continuous space and uh, uh, it will require significant hardware complexity computations compared to the binary DC method, right? And so we want to propose a new class. We just uh, propose a new class of HTC or VSA called finite group VSA, which will kind of interpolate between binary HTC and uh, continuous space HTC or VSA so as to bypass these limits, these similarity representation limits of binary, of binary HTC without using uh, continuous space. And in this way, we can solve the, we can express more similarity metrics that binary HTC cannot express. And meanwhile, we can keep the hardware efficiency of uh, uh, a limited set of, uh, of uh, uh, elements. For example, uh, specifically here, we are sampling the hyperspace, uh, the hypervectors are in the hyperspace G to the power D. Here G is a finite group. Theory, we, then we on this hyperspace, we can theoretically extend and define the operations arithmetic we have for standard uh, hyperdimensional computing. For example, similarity binding, bundling operations accordingly in this hyperspace in the in, in with uh, with in this uh, group VSA setting. And a very uh, very simple case is a cyclic cyclic group VSA, where the group is a cyclic group from uh, like uh, with elements uh, for example from zero to n minus one and uh, in this case the, the actually the, as a matter of fact the binding opera operation is just as uh, addition modular n and uh, uh, as we can see if n equals, to n equals two it's exactly same as binary HTC if n approaches goes to infinity it will approaches the uh, complex value FHR, the VSA, and it's kind of interplays between binary HDT and the continuous space, but it can, it's a finite group of cell and we do not need to worry about too much about the hardware complex, complexity and we'll show this effect in performance specifically, specifically later. And then a natural question you may have is that, okay, so what's the, is group of VSA stronger than the FHR using the complex complex uh, values or not, or which one is stronger or will any comparison comparison between them. And so first of all, we show that any similarity matrix that can be expressed by finite abelian group VSA means the, the group is abelian means that you can switch to the order of the group of group operations. It can be it also expressed by FHR. So in this sense, the final abelian group VSA is strictly less than the FHR. But on the other side, there exists similarity matrix that can be expressed by a non-binian group VSA. But this group, this matrix cannot be expressed expressed by FHR. So in this way, we can. We uh, group VSA can approach it, approach uh, FHR by increasing the number of 
uh, order of this uh, second group VFA, for example, and also it contains more than the FHR because it have is it can express more similarity matrices and uh, correspond to more tasks that group VSA can learn, but FHR cannot learn. And uh, what's more, uh, uh, this is a basic two solutions we propose to handle the, the trade-off using two, in two different manners. The first solution is that we use a different way of in sampling from the hyperspace. The other solution is to increase the complexity of, uh, of each element in the hyperspace. Instead of using binary, we use a group as a set, uh, underlying set, and which is also not continuous space. And then we try to use this model in different applications. And we also found something uh, you know, in our pipeline that we try to use learning instead of bundling method because well, what does it mean? It means that typically in a standard HTC model, we will train an HTC model by bundling hypervectors that are in the same class. For example, in the Amnist case, we bundle the hypervectors of images that belong that are of same digits, for example, of zero, right? We bundle them together to get a class representative. But this is a, a condition on the following assumption that the class representative SC is similar to each uh, element of uh, the, in the, in the TC class. And this is not always true, depending on the number of vectors being bundled together. If we have uh, more and more vectors in this TC, TC set, then the class vectors as C by bundling will be near orthogonal to each TI when this, uh, when this set becomes larger and larger. So instead, we try to use a different way because we want to con consider HDC computing in a larger data set. And which uh, in this case, bundling may not be that appropriate. So we try to use different way, which is called uh, using learning. We try to represent the class representative as a linear classifier and train this linear classifier with the category design of uh, opti optimization method. Uh, how, how can we do that? Um, we represent the class representative as a linear layer of size number of class, class times the dimensionality. So each row of, of this linear, linear layer will corresponding to the uh, or a class representative for different for all the classes. Then this linear layer will output a per class similarity uh, for uh, for any input hypervector. And this we found that this method actually helps learning the uh, class representatives and incurs actually incurs manner uh, very small training cost. And uh, uh, more specifically, we want to focus on the inference cost of uh, this method. And we found that actually the inference cost of an HDC model will remain the same as the bundling case because when we have finished the training, we just uh, uh, need to quantize it accordingly. For example, in the binary HDC case, the classify will accurate, uh, will do a binary binarized matrix multiplication inference, uh, inference time, and using O equals to the matrix multiplication of O multiplied to the sign of the element Y sign of the weight matrix, the class representative matrix. Then here I ask the input W is weight matrix, then it will give the per class similarity because due to the uh, operations in Binary HTC is very simple and straightforward. And uh, yeah, that's so, uh, basically the other method we use to 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 uh, you, um, learn for different tasks using HTC computing framework on on different uh, tasks. And then we try to evaluate our proposed models on different data set on different um, to measure the performance of these proper proposed models. Does uh, VSA or HTC with more similarity metrics to express will really help for some task where it help that to get empirically, not just theoretically. And here we can see the, uh, some different data sets, for example, uh, isolate, which is a speech, uh, speech data set consists of uh, audio signals. And uh, the goal is to uh, predict the letter name in that video audio, uh, audio signal 
And another one is the second is uh, is human activity database. It consists of features collected from smartphones and with 10, around 10,000 uh, samples. And the task is to predict uh, which type of activity a human will performing. And uh, we also want to use um, uh, this kind of framework on more challenging data set in machine learning you know, data set, for example, amnist and fresh amnist. And uh, it's kind of previously more challenging for HDC. Then we measure the performance of our proposed model of, against the different baselines. For example, the perception is a one bit random Fourier feature perception, it means that the perception is one bit uh, random perception with the random Fourier feature uh, as inputs. And also, we include the standard previously standard for that ADC method um, on this data set. Uh, isolate on all these four data set. And then the third row corresponding to for the HTC, we use the random for feature, random for feature way to initialize the hypervectors and we evaluate this model. And also we can use a group VSA can, combined with a random for feature way of initialization. And we found that, uh, uh, for example, the third row, the random for feature on uh, sampling. Uh, plus the habit binary habit dimension computing can already improve over the baseline stuff stuff at HTC on for example on random on amnist and the fashion amnist uh, actually on amnist because uh, here we evaluate uh, one epoch accuracy of the uh, linear classifier or we can just try and ten epochs which are not single pass lane but if we want to focus on single pass lane we just need to look at one epoch training uh, way. And uh, RFFHTC with one epoch training on MNIST is actually even 10, even higher than 10 epochs accuracy of previous HTC model on MNIST. And furthermore, when we use a group VSA on um, this different task, it actually improves model accuracy further. And by actually one more percent, when we have 10 epochs, more epochs on over the data set. And so this shows that the HTC models we propose actually learn, um, learn from a single pass learning or, or, or over data already in uh, actually very high accuracy on um, uh, standard benchmark, standard data, data set for HTC and also more challenged data set, for example, MNIST and fresh MNIST. And uh, then the question is that we also need to focus on the the hardware efficiency of this method. We do not, uh, the one advantage of VSA is that we do not need to use a continuous space. So we propose a way to measure the hardware efficiency or hardware latency of the per different models in hyper dimension computing. Specifically, we use the circuit depth complexity to quantify the potential hardware latency. Um, just to clarify, 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 the CDC is commonly used to, to analyze the computational complexity of Boolean functions, which is a length of longest path from the input to the output. If we, uh, if we assume that operations without the dependencies in the HTC can be fully executed uh, power line, means that element-wise multiplication of binding and animal-wise the sign of uh, the addition of all the hypervectors we uh, for these operations that do not have data de dependencies we can fully make them parallel then what's the longest path from the input to the output how many input gates we will need to uh, along the path and um, so this measurement makes this um, make it independent of the hardware design choice of different uh, hardware so you just measure the longest path from the input to the output. And here, if we assume the uh, feature vector n to be the feature vector length, and for example, um, for MNIST, the image is 28 by 28, which is 784, right, for MNIST. And these are the vector dimensions. And we can compute the CDC for uh, Hubble dimension HDC and group VSA and even perception and compare them together here. Uh, specifically, uh, if we look at the last row, we measure the CDC on MNIST. The binary HDC will have 295 and 60 group VSA of um, 
two to the three, or the three group VSA, it will be have a, a CDC of two, 405. And in the meantime, the perception, one bit of perception will have one near around one certain 300 CDC. And uh, so binary CDC and second group VSA are significantly less than this uh, random for a future perception. And to see it more clearly, this trade off between the group VSA, the order of group VSA, and its hardware efficiency, we plot this uh, figure as uh, you know, in, in the bottom here. The, oh, the lines here represent the epoch accuracy, the one epoch accuracy, and the final accuracy. Final accuracy means the 10 epoch accuracies. And on the right side, also plus the bars of the CDC when we increase the group order. And we can see that um, uh, at there are some point, uh, there's a kind of sweet point that at the order of two of two to the power of three uh, for the group VSA, you can achieve a, a satisfactory performance with respect to test accuracy. And also you can maintain a low hardware efficiency using measured by the uh, circuit depth complexity. And so in this way, we conclude that uh, uh, the first, uh, there's a clear connection between the, the set of expressible, expressible similarity matrices and the expressivity of HTC in a sense that if it, this HTC model can represent some similarity matrix, then it can learn some task and uh, it's stronger. Otherwise, it cannot learn the task. The second is that uh, this new notion of expressivity on HTC model uh, reviews the limits of HDC that computes with hypervectors. And based on this analysis of the limits, we provide a hint on how can we improve it uh, by two methods. One is using random for a feature to sample different from, from the hypervector hyperspace to match up the target similarity matrix. Or oh, we propose group VSA to express more to, to solve inherent limits of binary HDC while keeping the hardware efficiency. And the last, the non-trivial improvement of group VSA uh, on different data sets you know, from standard data set on isolate and on even on MNIST and official MNIST, which HTC does not look at before, actually paves a new way of um, using HTC in more challenging tasks and even in more challenging machine learning tasks in some um, graph learning and even large scale graphs. And we were interested in using HTC to work on, yeah. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your excellent talk, um, uh, indeed. So now I open the floor for questions. Maybe, maybe I can uh, start with a, a, a practical question. Uh, do you have um, uh, the implementation of these um, uh, methods that you uh, proposed as a kind of library that's, uh, that is publicly available? Because I think- uh, uh, Yeah, we have it, but we, uh, we, we, we were planning to publish. Uh, we, we actually published for a while, but later on due to some submission impulses, we, we canceled it. But yeah, if you want to have the library, we will publish soon. If you want to have it now, you can email me and we, I can share it direct to you. Yeah, because I, I think it would be uh, of great practical importance to, to have this generation methods that you reported, I mean, for, uh, I mean, easily accessible and easily uh, usable, so to say, because this yeah. a, a problem of um, uh, encoding and generation is, uh, I mean, it's extremely, um, uh, well, it, it, it's very important, I mean, for the overall performance and performance of different solutions, not only in classification tasks. Yeah, uh, the thing I wanted to mention is that um, previously at the very beginning, we actually, is, uh, we know that encoding of this is including a lot of for loops. And if we you do not power it efficiently, it will cost a lot, lot of time. For example, at the very beginning, we have a very vanilla version of encoding on MNIST of 60 training images, 60 thousand training images, and 10 thousand test images. It will cost us an hour to finish the encoding process, which is a very long time. Mm -hmm. Later on, we do some, we try to parallelize all the oper um, operations using, in, try to make the data, remove the data dependencies and uh, mix the operations bound and bundling 
are paralyzed possible. And now we can finish MNIST training in two minutes or one, mm -hmm. one and a half minute. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, this practical information is extremely interesting. I, I, I mean, from my personal perspective. But okay. So uh, please, I uh, pass the uh, uh, turn to other people to ask. Uh, hey Tao, it's uh, it's Dennis speaking. Yeah. I have a question. Was uh, I think we, we communicated earlier, and I had a I have a feeling that that your group VSA is very related to an earlier proposal that is called modular composite representations have you had the chance to make links to to this v, between that vsa model and and your proposal of a cyclic group vsa uh we look at that paper but we haven't included the uh the the uh the the, the, the connection in the paper because uh, currently, this paper is kind of kind of um, under review, and uh, we do not want to make a very large uh, uh, modification to the paper. But yeah, I, I I agree that it has very strong connection, but um, we haven't included it in the paper at least in this moment. I, I see. Okay. Do, have you have you had like based on that when you were looking at it? Have you had any chance to? Because, because my my intuition was that binding is exact like exactly the same as in group VSA, but I had a feeling that bundling operation and similarity measure were somewhat different. Have you had the chance to anyhow reflect on these similarities versus differences? Like, is it anything yeah, yeah, fund yeah. fundamental in cyclic VSA that 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 makes it more sort of more amenable from the theory point of view, re, re, let's say, compared to these um, modular cyclic representations. Yeah, um, uh, here's the thing. For, uh, the uh, binary operation of group VSA will certainly be different from the, the binary uh, or the pre uh, method. For, but the thing is that for the binding operation, uh, it's simple as addition modular array. Right? And uh, you know, uh, it's actually addition, and uh, then is the bundling and the similarity. The similarity is actually measured by the cosine. If, if we can, if you can imagine we embed all this similarity into a unit circle uniformly, right? It's you mm -hmm. can embed this cynical group VSA into the yes. unique circle in the in the complex um, in complex uh, plan, and then the the similarity is just the uh, in the product of that embedding vectors, right? And in that sense, you will need to use some uh, a, a cosine, uh, not, not cosine, the uh, uh, cosine of the that corresponding vector to compare to the inner product. But the problem is that if you have a very small, you, you, may, you may want to ask that the, the, then this complexity will be higher, right? You, you need to compute the cosine of the things, right? But the thing is that we, you can pre-compute this. We actually, you know, in our implementation, we can pre-compute this uh, cosine similarities of elements in this G uh, to get a table. And when you have that um, two half vectors, you need to just uh, query and do addition will be fine. Addition average without computing cosine average. I see. You know, use the lookup table, right? You yeah, mean. yeah. We can use a lookup table to finish uh -huh. that. The other one is the bundling method. The bundling method, problem of bundling method, I agree, it will be slightly complex. It will involve arc cosine function. The problem is if you want to change this model while using bundling have vectors, then you will you need to use the that arc cosine once during the training time, right? Mm -hmm. But if we choose to use linear classifier, mm -hmm. we only use binding operation and similarity operation. We do not actually use bundling operation. Okay, yeah, that's that's fair. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in that case, we just find is the, in the hyperspace that has the highest similarity to that, uh, to the other training set. So we do not need to use bundle in the second method. Right, but that's only one particular use case, right? Where you try to solve classification problems. So if you would try to construct like hierarchical representations with with this scheme, you would 
still need to use bundling, right? So it's still worth thinking about like the bundling operation. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Um, abstracting from your a particular classification application domain, right? Uh, basically, if you I think if you want to, uh, this actually does. Um, yeah, you can see uh, it's fair to see that this method learning method can only works for. The, Linear uh, for classification task, for example, in a general class, if we we I think we can have a similar message that we search in the hyperspace using some gradient de design based method to find the hyperspace with the highest similarity uh, score in the hyperspace, and uh, uh, I think there are some way to avoid the bounding operation if you really find the bounding operation uh, complicated. Yeah, I agree. Okay, yeah, thanks. Thanks for the reflections. More questions to Tao? Yeah, I, I'd like to talk about terminology. And, and the thing is that in, in, in algebra, I mean, word bundling means something, something quite different. I think it has a mathematical meaning. And it's not to be confused with this. Um, what I prefer is using using the terms the addition operation of this algebra and the multiplication operation of this algebra. And 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 so that that that's terminology that's commonly used in 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 math. And when you use those terms, then you sort of transport get freely some properties between these operations like invertibility, distributivity. And so I, I, I tend to recommend using, using this terminology rather than, rather than the terminology of binding and bundling because yeah, just, just think of, you know, how do you unbind? You use the binding operation to unbind. Now that to me is somewhat awkward, awkward way to say. But you use the multiplication operation to bind, or use the multiplication operation to unbind. That that to me seems rather natural. So, so I, 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 I just I just try to offer this terminology, certainly for people who come from the algebra point of view in, into this world. And, and then there's the, the other other comment, and that is permutation. Once once you have permutations among your things, and sometimes you have all finite groups, your, your math or your algebra includes all finite groups up to the size of the dimensionality, because permutations include all those. So, so I, 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 mean, I, I really liked your talk, and, and uh, I, I need to look at many of those things again, because he had some very interesting results. So I, I was very glad to see. Yeah, yeah, thank see, you. See this one. <laughs> Yeah, we, we the, 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 actually we also find the, the addition module as the, the binary, uh, I mean the binary binary uh, binding operation is very very similar to the, to the standard case, okay? and the bundling is, is kind of different because uh, at least for second group VSA it's not you can it's not that just a multiplication of these things, but yeah. And then there's, a, then there's another thing, and that is um, engineers use the circle plus as an XOR. And uh -huh. now that that is a distant modular too, but in the binary system, it, ten, it turns out to be the multiplication operator. So um, there's, going to, there's going to be some terminology, there's going to be some, some uh, notation that can confuse you, so I would say, you know, for pe people coming in this area. So I'd say in our papers, I think it's good we warn people about these things. Mm -hmm. The things are not noted, there's no standard notation, there's really no standard terminology. So we just have to fill in, fill in in our, in our paper, just, you know, help diffuse confusions. Uh, I, I can say from our side that in the recent papers, we try to introduce kind of an idea of that for binding operation, you one need, need to use 
kind of an abstract symbol i mean to kind of reflecting on what pente has said that that um like there, there is this outer product symbol that we see on this slide and also there is also symbol for xor so they are over defined and so we just pro propose to use a the so-called circ, which, which is just just an empty circle in in LaTeX, as a general symbol for binding, mm -hmm. and then depending on whether in within the context one talks about the concrete realization, such as a Hadamard product or XOR or outer product or circular convolution, then one could use like these specific specific symbols that are commonly used to denote these operations, but Kind of we try to suggest to use a more generic symbol for binding operation that is that is just an empty circle yeah one more thing we were our uh, was start doing the look at it you see that it kind of struggled for me to find a formal definition of what a HTC is or like a mathematical definition of what is a GTC like many people say HTC is vectors based with some operations and kind of not very massively defined in you know, some mass object space. So we try to generalize to, to like group SA by de defining some in a mass way, uh, algebraic way that uh, using group SA setting, you know, if you're interested, you can uh, look at our paper in the with same title. And yeah, we, we, we try to give a, a more mass of formalized definition of SA, a group SA at least, and uh, yeah. And I, I think this is important. This is really uh, interesting, indeed. Any more questions from the audience? Yeah, I, yeah, I had a question. Um, yeah, about the analysis as the expressivity. Can can you flip to that slide that had the, yeah, that that what you know the previous one where you had the showing that all yeah with the negative halves. Yeah, what what made that impossible? Is it the relationship amongst the negative similarities that they're all the same, or is it the magnitude? Like if we change those negative halves to negative one eight or negative one eighth or negative one tenth, would it be possible then? Or what's, can you give some intuition yeah. about what's going on there? Uh, yeah, if you don't mind, let me share a page of my paper, okay? One second. Sure, sure. Sure. We can actually theoretically characterize what what for binary DC, what's exactly the set of uh, express express expressible similarity matrix are the set we can correct it theoretically, for example. Can you see this here, right? Uh, yes. Okay. Okay. So here if we have three basic uh, uh, entities, entities, right? Then we, we then we want to look at the, the, the similarity matrix of three different sampled vectors in, in in the space, right? For example, then first beginning we we look at what we, d equals two in one dimension case, right? In one dimension case, we can enumerate all the possible all the possible similarity matrix as follows, because it's one dimensional. So the similarity of two different uh, have a vector will either be one or negative one, right? Because it's a, a one dimensional space, one dimensional have vectors. And we can enumerate all the four possible similarity matrix here in one dimension case. Then when D equals largest two, because you can write down the similarity matrix across dimension in the following sense, then here each VIK is one dimensional. This means that this similar matrix of a high dimensional vector in that hyperspace will be, uh, uh, if you consider an, uh, all the possible choice of a dimension, it will lie in the convex hole of this four uh, matrix. So if the matrix locates in the convex hole of this four matrix, okay, then it's expressible. Otherwise, it would not be expressible. 
reason for my uh, negative health is that when you do a linear combination of them, right? A convex linear combination of them, some terms will be contradicting to each other. When you, when you make, for example, you can try to make the first term equals to the target matrix, but the other terms will show some uh, conflict in the other places. That's why the negative half cannot be expressed. Uh, I hope this uh, helps kind of uh, illustrate it. Okay, but if it was if it was negative one eighth, could it it could be expressed then? If it's negative, a smaller number, a I like smaller uh, magnitude example. number. It, 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 certainly, I can. We have shown that if this is one negative one third, it can be expressed. Mm -hmm. okay. If it's negative one third, it can be expressed. Okay, uh, and and or any number smaller than negative one third, then it. Then it works. Some some of them can be, but not all of them. Yeah. I see. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. No problem. Okay, um, more questions to Tao? Well, let me see uh, the participants list. Anybody? Well, uh, you always can contact him via either via email list or directly, obviously. And the, the um, uh, video recording as well as the slides will be available offline. Uh, after the presentation. Um, but from my side, I just want to say uh, thank you once again to, uh, for the very interesting talk indeed. And uh, for the rest, I, I also, I mean, for those of you who are here, I want to flag um, uh, uh, one message about the next webinar. So most likely, um, so it will be postponed one or two weeks I will come back to you about the exact time uh, in a separate email because I have some personal difficulties with the um, 6th of June and I couldn't find substitutes uh, yet. But um, so uh, we wait for the last webinar of uh, this winter session, which was very rich for different talks, including obviously this one. So, um, and with this, I want to conclude this webinar. So thank you very much all for attending and thank you Tao for presenting this uh, material to us. So thank you once again and see you next time. Thank you. Bye.